Hello, listener. I'd like to play a game. For the past ten weeks, you have idly sat by and listened to this show while life passed you by. Now it's time for you to act. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, or face the consequences. Live or die. Make your choice. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Post Credits with Gil Garcia. Welcome to saw Timber, a month-long celebration of Saw the film franchise, leading up to my review of the latest installment, Saw 10, in theaters on September 29th. For the next three weeks, we will be reviewing every single Saw film, from the original to Spiral from the Book of Saw. Not only will we go over the plot, the design, and filmmaking factoids for each movie, but I'm also going to run through my favorite and least favorite traps in each and every one of these films. Much like my Guilty Pleasures episode that we did a few weeks ago, we'll be breaking free from our regular format. This week we're doing three films, and I'm going to spend approximately 15 minutes per movie, and by September's end, I will rank each film accordingly. We are going to rattle through these movies in their release order, since chronologically you'd be very confused. (laughs) So for today's episode, I'm going to be running through Saw 1, Saw 2, and Saw 3. Now, before we get started, I wanted to address my tease for last week. In my Mortal Kombat 1995 review, I teased that today I was going to review The Flash. The change of heart came last minute as I was looking over the theatrical release schedule. I thought Flash would be a good candidate for the show since it released right before our inaugural episode, and it just had recently come out on Max. So if you're expecting to get my review of The Flash, I apologize, but this Saw marathon, to me, is far more important and way more fun. (laughs) Will we ever get a review of The Flash? Maybe if things lighten up. Our fall season is going to be chocked full, and it's going to keep me pretty busy, so it's looking to be very unlikely for 2023. If you desperately want me to review The Flash, just let me know on social media. Otherwise, I'm pulling a James Gunn, and I'm erasing it from the post-credits timeline. (laughs) Now that that is all out of the way, let's get into today's episode and talk about Saw. Do these movies hold up? Or am I better off cutting off my leg and crawling away? (laughs) Let's begin and get into Saw 1. Alright, in Saw 1, two strangers wake up in a room with no recollection of how they got there, and they soon discover that they're pawns in a deadly game perpetuated by a notorious serial killer. Saw is directed by James Wan, famous for The Conjuring, The Conjuring 2, and Furious 7. It's written by Leigh Wannell and James Wan himself. The film stars Carrie Elwes as Lawrence Gordon, Danny Glover as Detective Tapp, Leigh Wannell as Adam, Michael Emerson as Zepp, Tobin Bell as John Kramer, and Shawnee Smith as Amanda. Saw was one of these movies I remember vividly watching when I was younger as a DVD rental. I don't recall its theatrical release at all. I was just a little bit too young for that. All I can really remember is my uncle bringing home the movie on DVD. And I looked at the box, and the box was really cool looking. It was translucent, and the slipcover had Gordon's leg on the foreground, and the actual DVD disc was patterned like a saw blade. So it kind of had this like 3D effect on the box. And I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. I kind of want to watch it. Now, around this time, I was approximately like 14, 15 years old. So I was in. I was old enough to enjoy horror movies, but still a little bit too young to watch a movie like this in the movie theater. But this was right on par for the spirit of the series. It began as a very independent horror film with a low budget, hardly any marketing, and a really unique premise. And upon watching it with my uncle, I was fascinated by the world they created. All of the plot twists and reveals were mind-blowing. And it was so simple, yet horrifying and effective in its execution. 
there's a big reason why this movie went from an independent darling to an annual Halloween horror film juggernaut franchise. (laughs) Now, my excitement to revisit these movies stems from my love for the original film. It has been a couple years since I last seen it, so I questioned myself, will I remember all the small details? The traps? The crazy editing choices? Does the movie hold up in 2023? I think it's about time that we dive into the review and revisit Saw 1. Now, looking back at Saw 1, I grew even more appreciation for it. Not only do I think the film holds up, but I believe it is severely overlooked in the horror film genre. Now, I know that's kind of saying a lot since this movie spawned 10 sequels and shit, but not a lot of people revert back to the original Saw when they talk about the franchise. Most of the discussions are always about, oh man, Saw went downhill. Oh, I stopped watching after this uh, Saw. But not a lot of people reference the original as being truly groundbreaking for what it was. And the delusion of the franchise over the years, with nine total installments, made this one very easy to forget in those discussions. Saw 1 is very much an indie film. From the get-go, the bathroom set is iconic. But it is also very necessary for the filmmakers James Wan and Leigh Whannell to cut costs in making this movie. The bathroom very much takes on a personality of its own in its layout and structure, requiring Adam and Gordon to work together to get to the bottom of the mystery as to why they are there in the first place. Adam has control over the saw blades, Gordon's family photos, the tape recorder, while Gordon has control over the light switch, the cigarette, the cell phone, and he overall has knowledge of the jigsaw killer that he can expose to Adam along the way. Now, the way the film is framed has both characters having to reach out, communicate to each other, while also holding on to their personal secrets. It's very clever and very provocative. I think it builds the characters really well in that they have to work together. The clue finding and puzzle solving takes a lot of the runtime. It gives the audience a chance to really meet and empathize with Gordon and Adam, and it builds their chemistry together. I would refrain from calling Adam and Gordon a hero, so to speak, because they have their dark secrets. There's a reason why they're in these traps. And it's because of these reasons that the philosophical and ethical mudding of their secrets root the game and the franchise with its overall message. You see, Jigsaw isn't just a standard serial killer. His methods of murder are done as a philosophical testing of the human ability and the human mind. The participants are trapped, they're placed in a grave situation, but they are given a chance to appreciate life and overcome the obstacles set in front of them. It's because of this ethical lesson that Jigsaw became a horror icon and an anti-hero of sorts. In this movie in particular, the traps are perfectly planned out and relevant to the overall narrative between Gordon and Adam. This is done so when the final reveal of Jigsaw being in the bathroom the entire time, when it hits, it's completely fucking (laughs) mind-blowing. Yeah, this, this movie really goes for it, and I think the overall spirit of the film really shines, and it's a reason why it gained a cult following and a sequel. Besides the original trap and the way the plot was laid out, the most iconic part of the Saw franchise are the traps. And there are some good ones in this movie. So I will do this for each movie that we review throughout the nine over the course of Sawtember. I'm going to talk about my favorite traps in each movie in no particular order. So let's talk about the barbed wire maze. It's simple, it's effective. It's about a man having to run through a maze of barbed wire because he had cut himself for attention. It looks extremely painful and grotesque, but also it's kind of fair and winnable. He just has to escape the room fast enough. I think the barbed wire maze was a good stepping stone for the overall franchise. Now, Zep's test. Zep serves as a complete subversion of our expectations on the identity of the Jigsaw Killer. And Michael Emerson, you know him for the show Lost, he has a knack for playing these morally ambiguous villains. And here we all expected that he really was Jigsaw. 
until the final act when we find out that he was actually a victim as well. Adam, on his corpse, picks out the tape recorder that Jigsaw left Zepp, and it kind of makes his come up in satisfying and sort of shocking and tragic that Zepp had to go along with this because he was a prisoner of Jigsaw's game in and of himself. And my favorite trap in the entire film is otherwise known as the goat, the greatest trap in all of Saw. And that is the reverse bear trap. Nearly every YouTuber on the planet will list the reverse bear trap as their greatest trap of the series. And I agree. It's panic inducing, it's solvable, and it's extremely horrifying. In this movie, we don't see what the overall actual outcome of the bear trap is on a person being killed by it, but the implications are devastating. Amanda has to get a key out of a human body and unlock the bear trap before it completely rips her face open. It is crazy. And I remember first seeing it and the still images of Amanda wearing the bear trap, and it is iconic. It is very terrifying. And the reverse bear trap is the goat. It is the best trap in the entire movie and probably in the entire franchise. So I'd be remiss not to talk about the saw traps I didn't like in this movie. First and foremost, the shotgun tripwire trap. You may not remember this because it's less of a trap and more of just a ambush. With the shotgun tripwire trap, Detective Singh gets killed by a lineup of shotguns that blow his head off when he walks over a tripwire. It's highly avoidable, and it made Singh look kind of stupid. There's no build-up to it at all. It just happens while he's chasing down John Kramer. I think it's kind of lackluster, and a lot of people forget about it. I didn't really like it overall. The next is the power drill chair. The stakes of this trap were extremely low since Tap and Singh were hot on the trail of John Kramer. And here, had they allowed the person sitting in the chair to just take one for the team... (laughs) The series may have been resolved right then and there, but this trap only serves as an extra hurdle on the main plot rather than a fleshed out torture lesson for Jigsaw's game. I don't even think we learn who the person is in the chair altogether. It's just kind of a throwaway trap. And now my least favorite trap in the whole entire movie. It is the flammable safe. It's a cool concept, but extremely unfair to solve. Jigsaw graffitis hundreds of numbers on the wall, and Mark must use any combination of those numbers to open a safe to get to the antidote, as he's being slowly poisoned in the room. On top of that complicated issue, he's doused in flammable jelly and has to carry around a candle to see what the numbers are on the wall. There was no way anyone could have solved this one, and Jigsaw is a straight-up murderer for creating this trap. (laughs) Like, you look at hundreds of numbers on the wall, how do you know what is the correct sequence? There's nothing laid out to indicate that Mark was given the proper tools to solve this riddle. He was either going to die by burning himself alive, which is what happened, or uh, die from the poison. It's completely unfair. I did not like it whatsoever. The visuals of the trap is cool, but (laughs) to add insult to injury, Mark also had to step on glass too. Like, what the fuck? That's just like extra, you know? Come on, Jigsaw. I know you're like at the beginning of your tenure as the iconic serial killer, but this was just completely fucked up, man. Like, you gave him no shot whatsoever and just relished in it. (laughs) So those are the traps that I remembered out of Saw 1, and I was extremely impressed and happy with my revisit of this movie. The movie definitely holds up and has only gotten better with age. Sure, some of the flash cutting and cheesy transitions and driving sequences look older, but that kind of adds to the rustic charm of the movie. In fact, I noticed right away that the sequence where Tap is chasing Zep back to the bathroom It's clearly shot on a soundstage, man. Like, they're sitting in a vehicle, like, angrily, like, moving their hands like they're controlling the wheel. But you could tell it was, like, not even shot on a street. There's no background whatsoever. It's just a cloudy room that they're sitting in, in a vehicle. So, (laughs) I think that doesn't, like, kind of hold up. But overall, it kind of adds to that low-budget charm, as I said. 
We talked a little bit about John Kramer, but Tobin Bell's voice acting in this movie is fantastic. And although this is the movie that John Kramer kind of has the lowest amount of screen time in, I think he his presence is felt throughout the entire movie. He's extremely creepy and effective in the way that he stages the game. This is also where we've seen Billy the Puppet, a handcrafted puppet made specifically for this movie. It's really creepy and it serves the dialogue choices and the game explanation really well. And of course, there's Carrie Elwes, Lawrence Gordon. He really does carry this movie, and I think without his name attached to the casting, I don't think this movie would have caught on as significantly as it did. Carrie Elwes ultimately makes the biggest sacrifice at the end of the movie by chopping off his own foot to save his family. It's very noble, it's tragic, and up until this point, we didn't know what the fuck was going to happen to Lawrence Gordon once he walked out of the bathroom. I'm going to give Saw 1 a very well-earned four and a half severed limbs out of five. In my opinion, it's a horror film classic and should be regarded in film school as a staple of independent horror filmmaking and world building. I really love this movie. I think it holds up and you can't convince me otherwise that it's 50% rating on Rotten Tomatoes is factual. I think this is a very good horror film. As I do with all the movies I review on this show, I also like to give you filmmaking factoids. Now before we move on to Saw 2, here are some factoids about the first Saw. I only briefly mentioned Danny Glover's detective tap earlier in the review. He was a very vital part in adding much needed acting gravitas and a big name to the picture. But did you know that his character, canonically, didn't die at the end of this film? The poor guy in the movie watches his partner get his head blown off. He takes a slash to the throat and even takes a gunshot to the sternum. However, he did not die in the movie. In the lore of Saw, Detective Tap comes back in Saw the video game, which was released for PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in 2009. In that video game, you play as Detective Tap shortly after the events of Saw 1. Spoiler alert for the video game. Tap ultimately survives Jigsaw's tests, but is sadly institutionalized, believing that his whole life is a Jigsaw trap forever. Kind of a tragic end to his character, despite him surviving. But it was really interesting that they kept him alive after the movie. With that being said, Danny Glover basically took the paycheck and ran, and only filmed his part in the movie for two days total. So when you play the video game, you can tell his likeness is not really true to Danny Glover's. He resembles him, but it's not Danny Glover's face imposed on the video game character. Talked a lot about the independent spirit of the film. Because the cost of the movie were so low, Saw ended up being filmed in only 18 days. Just think about The Flash, right? The Flash was filmed over three years, with millions of dollars spent on reshoots. Saw was filmed in 18 days. (laughs) Now to add to that point, Saw is still regarded as one of the most profitable horror films of all time. It was made for only $1.2 million and grossed over $55 million in its theatrical run. Nearly 50 times the budget it cost to make the film. That is a bona fide hit. So, naturally, with that success, Saw 2 was greenlit immediately on opening weekend when it grossed $18 million just on opening weekend. The next factoid I have for you is that that was no dummy. Tobin Bell was actually laying face down on the floor during the entire filming of the bathroom scenes in this movie. In context to Danny Glover's Two Days, Tobin Bell was actually there for all 18 days of filming, but really didn't have much to do besides laying his face on a dirty ground. So props to Tobin Bell for that. Now the last factoid I have for you is the decision to primarily film in a single location was not just a budgetary constraint, but a challenge. Filmmakers Leigh Whannell and James Wan challenged themselves to make a film that took place in a singular room as kind of a film school graduation gift to themselves. And they succeeded. This movie 
kicked so much ass at the box office. Props to Le Winnell and James Wan for that. So with that, I think it's time we move on to the next film in the franchise. Let's talk about Saw 2. After his son has gone missing, an abusive detective is caught in a deadly jigsaw game where they must rescue eight people trapped in a house before it's too late. Saw 2 is directed by Darren Lynn Boozman, written by Leigh Winnell and Darren Lynn Boozman himself, starring Donnie Wahlberg as Detective Eric Matthews, Tobin Bell as John Kramer, Beverly Mitchell as Laura, Shawnee Smith as Amanda, Dina Meyer as Detective Carey, and Eric Knudsen as Daniel Matthews. Saw 2 is the first film in the franchise I got to see theatrically. It was around this time that I was finally able to purchase R-rated movie tickets for myself, and my girlfriend and I at the time were obsessed with the franchise. We went to a pop-up Saw-themed escape room based on the films and made it an annual event after this. This was the one that really kicked it off for us. I remember at the time not liking it as much as I enjoyed Saw 1. The plot to me got more contrived and complicated, but it still kept its low-budget feel to it. Saw 2 really upped the stakes and broadened the world of Jigsaw, presenting more backstory into the life of John Kramer while giving us a fresh set of characters to root against or root for. Now, I know the story will get way more complicated as we get through saw Timber. But I just recall this one far more than the next few we are going to cover. I think thanks in part to having some of the best deaths in the series. And I think we should get to it and go over my modern review and favorite traps of Saw 2. Let's not bury the lead here. Donnie Wahlberg's Eric Matthews is perhaps the worst character in the Saw franchise. And that's really saying something. Not only is the character a complete tool, but the way he treats Daniel and his partner Detective Carrie makes him look to be an absolutely impatient psychopath. The plot twist that Daniel was locked in the safe behind Jigsaw the entire time, not only did it blow my mind, but it also frustrated the hell out of me. How can Leigh Whannell and Darren Lynn Boozman write a protagonist that is so vile and reprehensibly unredeemable that we actively root for Jigsaw? (laughs) Because that's how I felt by the time he beats John to a pulp at the end. Despite my hatred for Eric, though, I actually love the misdirect with the surveillance footage. In the final act, we discover that the events of the house were recorded hours prior to Jigsaw's confrontation, and that the FBI was basing their whole entire investigation on recorded footage. Now, revisiting this movie, knowing the knowledge that they were chasing down a dead lead, I picked up on a lot more subtle dialogue choices with Jigsaw that have aged really well including a moment early on where John tells Eric, right now, he's probably cowering in a corner. It's a very understated piece of dialogue, but it's incredibly important. It implies that the footage is pre-recorded and that John has watched over and studied the tape. His line about Daniel being in a safe place is a little less subtle, but it's still critical to the game that he has in store for Eric. And I really love that about rewatching it now. It's very intelligently written in that sense. Now, the house trap is the main crux of the action here. Eight players are trapped in a house, and that's being pumped with a nerve agent that will kill each of them within two hours. Throughout the house, Jigsaw has placed syringes with the antidote in elaborate traps designed to test each person individually. The characters in the house range from the previous movie survivor, Amanda, who has become a junkie again, all the way to this muscle-headed psycho by the name of Xavier. Their character traits are all diverse while sharing a similar secret within one another, which is that Eric Matthews planted evidence against them and locked them up in prison. Daniel, who has been completely innocent throughout the entire film, is now in danger of not only the nerve agent, but the rest of the players discovering who he's related to. It's a clever little dynamic that is thrown in by the second and third act of the film. Now, a couple characters do stand out to me in this movie, including Xavier as the main antagonist of the house, and Jonas, who appears to be the only level-headed person willing to play by the rules. Meanwhile... The other characters were just kind of cannon fodder, and I especially want to note Laura, played by Beverly Mitchell. 
She was the second most notable actor on the cast list here, yet she has virtually nothing to do in this movie. She mostly just cries and whines and she doesn't participate. And ultimately, she doesn't even have to live through her own trap. It's a complete waste of her seventh heaven fame. (laughs) And I think it's completely miscast. I don't think there's any reason why this character should have been played by someone who was as popular as Beverly Mitchell at the time. I think she might also be a candidate for the worst character in the franchise, to be honest. (laughs) Let's get to my favorite traps in the movie. First off, the movie starts with a fucking banger of a trap, and that is the Venus flytrap. It is one hell of an opening trap, I tell you that much. The Venus flytrap is excellent execution of the series' concept that a person must be willing to do anything they can to stay alive. When Michael cannot cut out his own eye to retrieve the key, he succumbs to the trap, which is filled with a bunch of rusted nails impaling his face. It's a brutal way to go out, and it really sets a tone for the rest of the movie. Obviously, it's a sequel, so the notion was bigger stunts, bigger stakes, and the Venus flytrap exemplifies that. This was a fantastic way to open the movie. Let's also talk about the needle pit. This trap is probably the one that people most remember for this movie, and it's because Amanda is thrown into a hole filled with syringes, forced to find Xavier's key for the lock that has his antidote. It's cowardly that Xavier wasn't man enough to complete his own test, but it's extremely intense and brutal because at that point, Amanda was a character that you actually sympathize with. This was her second time being thrown into a saw trap, so to see her thrown into those needles, it sucked. And the image of seeing the needles poke through her skin and impale her and stick out of her legs and her arms as she climbs out of the pit, it's tragic and it's brutal. That trap alone triggered a lot of people (laughs) and it definitely is one of the most memorable parts in the entire franchise. Now another simple yet effective trap that doesn't get enough recognition is the razor box trap. It's a throwaway trap that ends up killing Addison. She simply has to retrieve a syringe from inside of a glass box, except the holes that the box has have these serrated shards of glass that will slit her wrists as she enters her hands through the holes. If she pulls her hands out quickly, it's very likely that she'll cut her hands off completely. But if she slowly keeps her hands in there, She's going to bleed to death. Ultimately, she rushes into the trap without listening to her tape. And I think the solution to this trap was that there is a key that you can see in the foreground of the glass that needs to be retrieved and it opens the side of the glass cage. Reddit speculates that she could have performed this trap with one arm slot in, grabbed the key, and then unlocked the box and got her syringe out. But instead, at this point, she's so drugged up and and desperate that she just throws her hands in there nonchalant, thinking that she could just grab the syringe. But instead, she's trapped there forever, and Xavier leaves her to her doom. It's a severely underrated trap in the grand scheme of the series, and I actually love the way that it's designed. It's simple and effective. Now, here are a list of the traps that I didn't like in Saw 2. First of all, the safe combination. The room that the participants begin in has a safe with an antidote in it for everyone. The key to unlocking it is, quote, somewhere over the rainbow. A.K.A. the key combinations are written on the back of each person's neck. But who could have ever figured that out? (laughs) There was no particular sequence laid out for them to solve the riddle. And I find that the trap was nearly impossible for the team to decipher between themselves. This ultimately borders on impossibility and just being an unfair puzzle. And the last trap that I want to talk about is the rigged staircase. During the breach of Jigsaw's compound, a couple of SWAT team members are locked in a steel cage on a staircase. Billy the puppet comes out to surprise them, and then there's a trap that triggers that breaks the shins of one officer, 
And as he falls backwards, he leads the crew onto the fence, which is electrified, electrocuting and killing all three of them in the in the trap. I honestly don't know how they could have avoided this, especially since Jigsaw invited them into the compound. (laughs) It seemed completely out of pocket and kind of cruel on John's behalf that he invites Eric and the SWAT team to his compound and proceeds to break the shins of some of the officers and kills three of them just without a game or anything. It's just a a booby trap, so to speak. Home Alone style. (laughs) Now, the other traps like the furnace and the peephole are good, but they're not really noticeable. Overall, I feel like Saw 2 has a great litany of scares and puzzles, and I enjoyed them all for the most part. But as for the story, I do have gripes about Eric being such an irredeemable douchebag of a protagonist, and the payoff in the end that Amanda is John's secret accomplice is a fantastic twist that I never saw coming the first time I watched this movie. I loved her version of the game over sequence at the end of this movie. And with that twist, I gained a whole lot of optimism that this series was going to bring some interesting new material to the table following the fact that Amanda is carrying on John's work. But we'll see. As we go along in September, we'll see if Amanda is the true mastermind of everything that's happening in this franchise. Now, with my new perspective on Saw 2, I can openly admit that I really like this movie. I think it's gotten better with age, much like the first movie. And despite the writing shortcomings and the character dynamics, initially I would have rated this movie a 2.5. But today, I give Saw 2 three and a half syringes out of five. I had a great time watching this movie, and I now regard it as one of my favorites in the entire franchise now. Saw 2 is still very good and very much in the spirit of the first film. I think Darren Lynn Boozman and Leigh Whannell really did a good job here despite James Wan leaving the franchise. Now here are some filmmaking factoids about Saw 2. To conceal the plot twist that Amanda was Jigsaw's accomplice the whole time, The actors who were acting inside the house trap were not given the final 25 pages of the film script. I respect the hell out of that decision. It adds more authenticity to the moments where Xavier and the others were adversarial or empathetic towards Amanda. And them not knowing the ending is really cool. I like that idea. And it's an idea that they carry on through some of the other Saw movies too. So let's keep that in mind. The infamous needle pit trap was also filmed over the course of four days. Each needle was meticulously fitted with a safe fiber tip so that when Shawnee Smith or her stunt double was thrown into the pit, they could safely peruse around the needles practically without the need of CGI or anything like that. It actually took four people to replace each and every tip of the needles and place them inside the vat. That is some really cool filmmaking, and I respect the prop manager and all the grips that had to put the syringes into the pit. Very cool factoid right there. Now, because the original shooting location of Saw 1 was unavailable, the return trip to the bathroom from the first film had to be recreated from scratch. Now, I imagine how painstaking the process of recreating the entire bathroom was, You had to match the continuity of the body parts and the blood and the limbs and Adam's body just to match the film between the first and the second. One thing I did not know about this movie, the advertising for the film had to be removed initially. The MPAA found that its depiction of the severed fingers were too graphic for commercial use on posters and billboards. I always found it kind of weird that they used severed fingers like that since they never really reference a trap that did anything with fingers in the movie at all. It was just a cool marketing gimmick, I guess. Now my final factoid for Saw 2, Billy the Puppet has been used sporadically through these two movies. Now in a couple of these shots, he has been seen riding out on his tricycle. In the previous film, Billy was controlled using a fishing wire that would wheel him out on his tricycle. Now, however, because Saw was such a mega hit and commercial success, the budget for Saw 2 was dramatically increased. 
Billy was actually able to be controlled remotely. So when you see Billy in this movie on his tricycle, it's actually an RC car, so to speak. (laughs) And still to this day, Saw 2 is the highest grossing Saw film in the franchise in the United States. So that wraps up Saw 2. I don't think we should stall any further. Let's keep the momentum going and let's go to our last film of the week. And that is Saw 3. In Saw 3, Jigsaw abducts a doctor in order to keep himself alive while he watches his new apprentice put an unlucky citizen named Jeff through a brutal test. Saw 3 is directed by Darren Lynn Boozman, written by Leigh Whannell and James Wan, and it's starring Tobin Bell as Jigsaw, Shawnee Smith as Amanda, Angus McFadden as Jeff, Bahar Sumek as Lynn, and Dina Meyer as Detective Carrie. Saw 3 to me represented a turn in the franchise, and it was the same way with a lot of people. It was the start of a string of convoluted side plots and irrational twists. This was when the series was at its peak, though. Around this time, they announced a maze at Universal Studios' Halloween Horror Nights, it got its own theme park ride in England, and Billy the Puppet became a really popular Halloween costume. This movie I remember watching at a theater outside my city as part of a double date. We went to the movie, and then a couple days later, we went to the Halloween Horror Nights maze to check it out. The maze was cool and intricate, and people in pig masks were jumping out and scaring us. They recreated the bathroom scene, and Billy the Puppet was the line cue narrator. It was really well done. We were officially in the golden age of Saw at this time. And as for the film itself, I didn't mind the problematic characters and story that were told here at the time, but looking back on it, I think my opinion might have changed significantly more towards a negative when it comes to Saw 3. So that kind of leads into our review. What made Saw special to me was the morality of John's game and the subjects that he was throwing into them. The first two films felt like he plucked some everyday ordinary bad people and decided to give them life lessons. Starting with this movie, we began to see a pattern of victims that Jigsaw started having a personal vendetta and connection to. Here we also see more of his backstory and that it would become an integral part of the franchise going forward for future installments. In this movie, the targets of the trap include Detective Carrie, Eric Matthews again, and Amanda for her third test. Looking back, I really think this movie was supposed to like kind of cap off the franchise since it closes a few loops in the storytelling department. I think Saw was originally supposed to be a trilogy, but given the boatloads of money that this movie drew, they couldn't help themselves and they obviously went on with the franchise. But in this movie, there is so much that they closed off that it really kind of boxed in the writers a bit. Amanda being John's accomplice was ample with so many opportunities and I think Shawnee Smith could have carried the franchise going forward, but instead... They simultaneously kill off John and Amanda in the final scene of the movie. It creatively boxed out the writers for the next few films as they would have to compose some convoluted workaround for not having an antagonist to carry on John's work. In fact, Saw 3 was the final movie written by Leigh Whannell and James Wan. But I'll save that for another discussion in next week's episode when we cover Saw 4, 5, and 6. The biggest problem I faced while watching Saw 3 was buying into our main characters' tests, Amanda's and Jeff's. On one hand, Amanda is a completely different character in this movie. She isn't just a junkie, she comes off as a complete sociopath. Her blatant jealousy and weird sexual attraction to John Kramer somehow makes her look weak and fall into some questionable decisions. I don't know what the fuck they were doing with Amanda in this movie. And for a character that has endured so much throughout the span of the three movies and three traps, to make such reckless decisions, it didn't feel like Juan and Winnell fully knew what they wanted to do with her. And then, there's slow-ass motherfucking Jeff, as YouTube's Dead Meat James liked to call him. I mentioned Eric Matthews may be the worst protagonist in the entire Saw franchise, But I may have jumped the gun. (laughs) Jeff is far worse than Eric. 
Throughout this movie, he is unlikable, he's vengeful, he's an abusive piece of shit husband who let the death of his son destroy his entire family, not to mention his relationship with his daughter. And his test in the movie hinges on him forgiving and saving the people who were involved in the death of his son. Thematically, I kind of like the idea of challenging a subject to face his child's murderers, but Wanell and Juan made Jeff way too reprehensible and way too stupid to fit into the Saw universe. Dead Meat called him slow-ass motherfucking Jeff for a reason. <laughs> Throughout his test, he sees his subjects in a deadly position and then proceeds to have full-on discussions with them while they're dying in front of him. And for each test, he eventually attempts to try and save them, but it's already too late. Dude, you don't get brownie points for trying to save them. You were so committed to having a full-on fucking conversation with them that you let them die. <laughs> He basically figures out how to save them right after they're already dead. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, it was really hard to watch this dipshit fumble around his test. I don't recall hating him the first time I watched this movie, but I really fucking despise him now. He is a single-handedly the biggest problem with this movie as a whole. <laughs> The icing on the shit Sunday, so to speak, is when Jeff ultimately kills himself, his daughter, Lynn, and John all in one blow, proving that throughout his horrific night, he didn't learn a damn thing. If this were the final Saw movie, I think this ending would be remembered more. But since it's undoubtedly just another Saw movie, people look past it but I think it was the start of the decline for Saw narratively. But at least we have the traps to look forward to, right? Before we talk about the traps here, I want to preface this part of the film review by saying that my grading of them changed between Saw 1 and 2 to this one. Solely because this movie establishes that Amanda purposely made these traps unwinnable. I cannot fairly rate them on their win possibility this time, but on their aesthetics only. So here are my favorite traps from Saw 3. The first one is the rack. Jigsaw in the film deems it as his personal favorite, and I must agree. Seeing a person getting twisted apart is so insanely creative and jarring that it stands out as one of the best traps in the entire franchise. Sadly, slow-ass motherfucking Jeff took his sweet-ass time to try and save Timothy, which may have not been possible anyways, but... We do get to see the trap work to all its mutilating glory, so I gotta give it credit for that. It's very creative. The next trap that I really enjoyed from Saw 3 was the pig vat. This is a disgustingly simple and cruel game. The judge who let Jeff's son's killer walk free is strapped to the bottom of a vat, while pig corpses are being thrown into a grinder. The pig innards are rushing to fill the vat and it slowly starts drowning the judge. This trap does not get enough love, but man is it disgusting and violent. This, is, this should be regarded as one of the best saw traps of all time in my opinion. It is insane. And then the other trap I really liked in this movie was the angel trap. Detective Carrie is placed in an elevated mechanism where her rib cage is attached to metal arms that will rip her apart if she can't unlock the trap. I love the look of this game, but I dislike the fact that it's rigged for her to lose no matter what. And Carrie, in all fairness, throughout the three movies that she's been in, she's not a bad person. She doesn't deserve to be put in a trap, but she's thrown in here because Amanda sees her as a loose end that she has to get rid of. Carrie deserved better than this, but man, at least she looked great going out. When the rib cage gets ripped apart, it is brutal and it is beautiful at the same time. I really liked the way that this trap was shot. Now, despite having three of the best traps in the franchise, Saw 3 also has some of the worst. <laughs> Here are the ones that I really disliked in this movie. First and foremost, the classroom. The classroom is basically the, the kickoff to the entire movie. A character named Troy has been chained to the walls of a classroom using these big looping chain links. He must rip apart his body to escape the room before a bomb explodes. I hated this trap for two reasons. One, the chain in his jaw is impossible to remove. 
he would have essentially had to rip out his whole jaw, which would have effectively killed him just from the exposure and the trauma itself. And two, even if he somehow completed the task, it's revealed later on that the exit door was sealed shut anyways. Amanda basically murdered this guy with flair and no win probability, and I think it's complete horseshit. <laughs> The second trap that I disliked was the shotgun collar. Much like most of these traps, Lynn was put in an awful position. She has to perform a cranial surgery to keep Jigsaw alive so that the collar didn't detonate and blow her head off. Her collar is directly tied to Jigsaw's heartbeat, so if he dies, she dies. How much more convoluted can a trap get? It's insane! And the fact that a brain surgery had to be done in the middle of the film just to keep her trap from going off, even for a brain surgeon, that's impossible. And given the situation that she was in and the room that she was in, she had to perform brain surgery with power tools and basic anesthesia. And the reason why this trap sucks so much is because despite her being successful with the brain surgery, Lynn has no way to get out on her own volition. There isn't a key to unlock the collar, and she's held hostage on the premise of Amanda and Jeff's test. Amanda wants to kill her anyway because she fucking gets jealous of her uh, attraction to John for some reason, and her survival hinges on John staying alive. Once again, this one is horseshit. And the one I really disliked about this movie was Amanda's test. The movie culminates in a dud of a reveal at the end of the film where Amanda completely changes her attitude and motivation halfway through the film, which makes this test so un unbelievably stupid. She gets upset, angry, and sexually jealous that Lynn is getting close to John. Keep in mind, at this point in the movie, John has his skull splayed open. <laughs> I don't think this motherfucker is getting any. I think it's ridiculous, it's almost too easy to win, but Wanell and Juan did a complete disservice to Amanda by having her end in this sort of fashion. She fails the test because she is just too emotional. It's ridiculous. I did not like the way that they ended Amanda's story in this movie. She had so much potential to carry the franchise, and they kill her off this way, and it just it's very disappointing. I don't hate Saw 3, but it did mark the beginning of the end of the franchise in its aesthetics and its independent goodwill. The franchise would go on to believe that bigger is better, and better means soap opera level acting and drama, because that's what we're in for with next week's episode. <laughs> There's so much soap opera shit that goes on in the later films, and we'll, we'll talk about it more. Looking back on this movie, though, I think I was a bit more favorable in liking it, because I was younger, and because I wanted to see gross horror. But the movie is just not as good as the previous two. Saw 3 gets two limb twists out of five. And now we go into the final filmmaking factoid segment of the episode, before we close out this week's show. The first filmmaking factoid is actually pretty hilarious, but during the scene when Amanda revisits Adam and snuffs him out, the producers of Saw didn't want to handcraft and recreate the bathroom from scratch. But luckily, there was another studio that had a bathroom for them to use. The studio behind Scary Movie 4 meticulously recreated the set in a parody in their movie, and made it available for the producers of Saw to shoot on their set. Think of it. A horror franchise has to ask permission from a parody franchise to use the trademark set for their own intellectual property. <laughs> that is so bizarre. <laughs> but fortunately, Scary Movie 4 had a very convincing recreation of the bathroom. Now, the film's most graphic scene was John's brain surgery. And it only remained in the film because the filmmakers lobbied to the MPAA that its portrayal was similar to an actual surgery you would see in a documentary or a training video, giving it a bit of a merit as to why audiences should be allowed to see it. I mentioned that I really liked the pig vat trap. In fact, the pig vat is the personal favorite trap of Tobin Bell. To film it, 
The pig carcasses were made out of foam, rubber, and latex, but the maggots that they used that were chewing up the carcasses were real maggots. It's really gross, and I take solace in the fact that Tobin Bell loved this trap himself. So this is the film that introduces the series' main antagonist that will carry on the rest of the franchise, and that is Detective Hoffman. Hoffman's name originates as an homage to the late producer of Saw 1 and 2, Greg Hoffman, who died right before the release of Saw 2. Now you wouldn't know it, but Shawnee Smith was actually pregnant during the filming of this movie. She looks good for her uh, condition. (laughs) And lastly, adding to my suspicion that the story flaws were due to poor writing and planning, Saw 3's script was being constantly added to and modified throughout the making of this film. Leigh Whannell remained on set throughout the filmmaking so that he could work on the script between shots. In fact, one scene between Lynn and Amanda was not in the script, but instead he scribbled it down on a napkin only five minutes before they filmed the actual scene. Pretty crazy, and it actually makes a lot of sense why I didn't like this movie as much. So that ought to do it. Saw 3 was a wild ride and a great jumping off point for today's episode. I would like to thank you for listening to the first episode of Saw Timber, and ask that you return next week when we tackle Saw 4, 5, and 6. So what do you think of the Saw franchise? Do you have any experiences or history with the film and its commercial success? Let me know on social media. On Twitter or X, I'm at GilX87. On Instagram and threads, my name is Gilly087. And on YouTube, search and subscribe to Post Credits with Gil Garcia so you don't miss another episode. Thank you once again for joining me today for the first episode of Sautember. And this is Game Over.